Hi everyone and welcome to Innovation and Facilities Management and Workplaces. My name is Emma Hendry and I'm CEO of Hendry Group. And what we are is we're a built form advisory firm that's leading in Australia. So we really pioneered the statutory compliance and risk mitigation space about 36 years ago. And over the last few years, we've really invested quite heavily in technology and we've really moved into that asset optimization space. And we really see ourselves as an ecosystem enabler. And that's what's paramount in this digital revolution. It's not necessarily one company or one technology. It's holistically an ecosystem learning how to integrate and connect with one another for superior outcomes. So why is this topic so pertinent and important today? Well, businesses are changing and their business models are being disrupted at an ever increasing pace, which means the way that we build, design and manage those buildings needs to change and transform alongside the requirements of our clients or else we will be disrupted by outsiders. So before we start to analyse the trends within our sector, it's really important to unpack, especially because this is called the mega trends area, unpack those trends that are severely impacting are going to have an exponential disruption on our sector. So we've all heard about Industry 4.0. The digital revolution is here, it is now. But what's very alarming, McKinsey estimates that only 8% of companies believe that their current business models are going to allow them to survive in a digital economy. And where then that um, is parallel is when we draw into the return on investment of digital strategies. Those fast movers, the first adopters, are going to exceed a 12% return on investment to revenue and fast followers are going to get a 6%, but laggards will actually fall behind and become obsolete. Additionally, we're now heading into a labour shor shortage. So in the next decade, we are going to grow by half the labour force than we did in the previous decade, which means we're going to see significant skill gaps and labour, especially in our sector that is so encumbered with labour-intensive capital projects and management. So we really need to see technology as an enabler to sort of um, bridge that gap between where talent is today and where it's going to need to be. Additionally, we are moving to a more globalised um, digital economy. So in the property seg um, segment today, it's extraordinarily fragmented and localised. And that's part of the reason why the technology adoption hasn't been as rapid as what we've seen in other um, segments. So with the move towards these digital technologies, we're going to see a rapid globalisation, which we are, which means that the political terrain and how we trade with one another and our different cultures are going to impede upon our existing business models. And as what's playing out in the media today, especially in Britain, with those trade agreements, we are all going to have to become fluent in disrupting our current business models to meet the nature of today's world. And finally, population. Population growth is obviously a big impact upon the way we work and live in buildings. Currently, about 65% of all people live in urban regions, and this is only set to going to increase. So this is where, as an individual, we are now spending 80% of our time indoors in buildings. So our sector, facilities management, and the entire ecosystem that goes around this is really um, so pertinently important to this transition into workplaces of the future and also smart buildings of the future. So now diving into the property sector. So today it's estimated that the property sector is worth about 220 trillion USD. And then when we drill down into the global FM market, it's worth about $1.1 trillion. So that's quite a mega market. And you would have heard today that it really is the biggest asset class in the world, especially where I'm from in Australia, if you couldn't hear my accent. Um, it is the largest contributor to GDP and our biggest employer of our population, which really means that the way that this is going to be disrupted is going to heavily impact majority of our people. And so prop tech investment in 2017 and 18 was 22 billion and the global smart, um, sorry, smart building market was at, is worth about 58. So what does that say to you? It says we have a really mega market with a lot of existing building stock. We're seeing a rapid rise in tech as well as smart buildings. But if you flip onto the other side of the slide, the scary part is existing businesses, incumbents in the property market, only have a 14% of them have an innovation strategy. So 
What does that mean? Well, 1% of revenues in the property sector today are reinvested into R&D, as opposed to aeronautical and automotive industries, which range between 4.5 to 7%. So this means we're not just a laggard, we're going to continue to be a laggard into the future. So we'll drill down now a little bit further into these different trends that are emanating out of the FM market. So we're moving and evolving towards this outsourced marketplace where we have integrated services. And that's really playing out in that globalised platform. But what is going to be so important for global FMers or even the, the existing incumbents locally is their ability to integrate along that value chain Currently, it's very siloed and fragmented. And so for our clients to have this seamless, autonomous way of working, we are going to need to be able to work with the different ecosystem members that come in and out of the assets life cycle at different points in time to be able to give that continual flow of working um, and in a pursuit of a common interest. Multi-generational workplaces, we're about to live 100 year lives. The generation coming up now will no longer live this three cycle life period. They're entering a stage where there's gonna be five generations in one workplace, which means that the buildings that we provide and the workplace of the future is going to be very different to what we've existed today. And finally, wellness programs. About 80% of all employees put this down as a number one criteria for why they will stay at their current employer or they will be attracted to move to a different employer. So if our buildings aren't facilitating these wellness programs, they're going to be non-competitive. And that doesn't just mean clean air or good lighting, it actually means being able to have a seamless, frictionless working environment where I'm able to feel a deep connection with my community and also feel that I'm a part of something greater than me and I'm providing for a more sustainable future. Co-working, 60% of occupiers today believe that this is going to pour, um, form a part of their strategy. So that doesn't mean just co-working places. This means having that inside your building. And you'll find that a lot of organisations now are trying to have the um, accidental run-ins, so which really form an innovation strategy where two different people from two different businesses or business arms are able to accidentally meet and form a different conversation to the homogeneous thought that exists today in the way we structure our workplaces. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the smart tech and building world in a minute, but personalization, I want you all just to think, what do you expect out of your social media digital world today. We expect Google to know who we are, where we want to go, how long. We want to know, um, for example, when we're about to order food, suggest something that we might enjoy. But what, that, what does that mean for our working environment? That is going to change as well. The expectations of the individual and the personalization that they count is going to become an important factor in success of a new workplace. So, why is this ever more important than ever? Well, smart buildings is going to, set, is going to grow by 34% by 2022, which means the marriage between the existing physical world and the digital world is going to become ever more prevalent in the way we do business. I'm not going to run through every single technology that makes up a smart workplace because you can head downstairs and have a look at all the vendors here today, but it's not one thing. But what is really coming clear in the mega trends is that seamless, frictionless way of working. I should be able to na navigate myself around a space in the optimal way. Employers want the analytics deriving out of the use of the space. So space utilization, the correlation to productivity and innovation, um, people's um, absenteeism versus retaining and recruiting top talent. And these are all coming in and being digested to make smarter outcomes and decisions. So when we look at a smart building or a smart workplace, we can't just look at the technologies in isolation. We need to start to view how they interact and where they cross over. And then again, we all get stuck in what we know in this siloed approach. Smart buildings, 
leads to smart cities. And that's um, going to be even more important into the future. But what is critical for smart workplaces, it also leads to smart communities. Now, the younger generations coming out today, they believe that their digital community is just as important as their physical community. And that could be formed on the company that they work for, or it could be formed on a common interest. And that's where, for example, tenant apps come in at an accelerated rate because we're allowing the individual to feel part of a community that just isn't physically around them today. Where does it all start from? It all starts from digital design. And it's not just designing in BIM or digital means, it's redesigning how we do business. So if there's any facility managers or asset managers in the room today, procurement, how do you design your procurement models? How do we procure for short-term contracts with long-term goals, align multiple stakeholders? So think about the ecosystem members that will touch that building as soon as it's handed over to the end of its life cycle. And this is where we have to design the outcomes and work with the ecosystem members in order to facilitate and incentivize these strategic outcomes to come to fruition. So I'm going to give you just a live example, something that I'm extremely passionate about. There is this concept emanating out of Oxford University about the digital passport. And it's something that I've really been researching and loving for a long time now. And basically, the digital passport is from the other side. It's the transactional side. But the data should stay with the asset. And right now in the property ecosystem, the information that is included in a building gets lost. And it, it's included in disparate data sets all along the value chain which gets lost and repeated as ecosystem members come inside and out and there's so much value with that data that is being left on the table so it's a way of centralizing data and they're also increasing the value of these buildings because it's not just the physical asset that now has a, a value attached it's also the insightful um uh, sorry it's the analytical insights that you can derive from that information and then moving on to the digital passport many of you may have seen the other presentation earlier today about them but an important fact it's not just one piece of technology and that's why I've put numerous sort of tech up around that it's an integration piece that allows individuals in real time to understand a physical asset or system and then gain intelligent insights from that immersive experience to make intelligent outcomes so what would an intelligent building with a digital twin do for you? Well, it's estimated, and this is also from empirical evidence stemming from aerospace and other capital intensive industries, it's telling us that it can give us a reduction in our environmental efficiency by 70%. It allows us to have productivity increases by 50% and reduction of operational costs by 30%. But this isn't just these sort of big label figures, it has to be managed correctly as an ecosystem. So I know I'm about to run out of time in about two minutes, so I'm going to just quickly run through. With opportunity, there's also current barriers and pitfalls. Some of the biggest pitfalls that we see today when people are trying to implement a smart building is all these buzzwords that we're hearing around. Everyone's talking about AI and data and this platform and that platform. But if there's no coherent strategy from the outset as to what you want to achieve, you're not going to grab the right technology. Additionally, there's numerous ecosystem members that would benefit from that technology as well as from that data and we're not taking that into account. So having that widespread ecosystem approach is pivotal. Secondly, our infrastructure. Don't install encompassing software or assets that can't evolve with you because your strategy is going to change. If it doesn't in 12 months, you become obsolete. And it's a real important factor to start to allocate capital for periodic reviews and not just think it's a one-time investment. And the real barriers that we're currently seeing in the market today is adoption. It's that true penetration from the bottom up. So C-suite can say what they want, but it's the people on the ground that make the, the tiny decisions that really enable whether these strategies and technology are successful or not. I've already addressed quite a few of them, but it's the cultural change. Disruption is here and technology is an enabler. And we have to all get on board with that. 
Also, we need to move past this silo approach, this fragmented market that we currently exist in, and ecosystem members in each stage of the asset need to learn to work together and say, um, what can I use from that particular stage? And when I'm making decisions, how does that impact the other ecosystem members and the other stages in the life cycle? And one part about government and regulatory body. So I play in the risk and compliance space, but there is an issue currently with data, machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's social and corporate anxiety because we don't have an international code of ethics. And that's a real issue for adoption for the individual. Is my data safe? I'm worried about how my staff will feel if they think I'm tracking them. And these are questions that we need to talk as a group and as an industry to put pressure on regulators and government to have these tough conversations. Additionally, I want to leave you on this particular note. How can regulation be updated at the rate that technology is accelerating, let alone enforced? And so we have to redefine how these, te um, how these legislations are inhibiting our our, um, our technology progression. Just an example, I use gamification in emergency training where I can put you in a simulation and see how you act. The government in Australia doesn't allow me to tick that off. I still need to turn up to site and do a face-to-face -face really boring, boring um, emergency evacuation where only half of you will turn up. And so this is where technology and regulation and industry need to come together and form a nexus where we have a future-proofed version of how we need to do business. I'm going to end with the rewards. Every, the rewards are extraordinarily clear, but what is most important is they're not always easy to um, form into a financial metric. Some of them are much more difficult and we need to take a balanced scorecard approach and all of us together need to work in a systematic way that enables a holistic view of what uh, the built industry will look like in the future. Thank you.